Professor Dave and Chegg here. For most of the reactions we will learn in organic chemistry, electrons tend to remain paired. Whether in a covalent bond or in a lone pair, we know that electrons don't like to be by themselves. However, electrons can also be unpaired, and species with unpaired electrons are called free radicals. It will be important to know a bit about the properties of free radicals and the reactions they undergo. So let's take a closer look now. First, we want to understand that carbon radicals will behave similarly to carbocations. Both of these are sp2 hybridized and therefore exhibit trigonal planar geometry. Because they utilize sp2 hybridized orbitals, the carbon must have one unhybridized 2p orbital left over. And with the cation, that will remain empty, whereas for the radical, the unpaired electron will sit in that orbital. Just like a carbocation, we will consider a carbon radical to be a form of electron deficiency, and therefore a source of instability. So this determines the kinds of chemistry radicals will do. Also, because radicals are a form of electron deficiency, the carbon radical stability trend will parallel the carbocation stability trend, whereby the methyl radical is least stable, and the radicals become more stable as the carbon that bears the radical becomes more substituted, from primary to secondary to tertiary. And then a so-called allylic radical will be more stable still, due to resonance stabilization, just like a carbocation at this position would be. However, we should note that unlike a carbocation, a carbon radical does not indicate a formal charge. The carbon that bears the radical is still contributing four electrons to its Lewis structure, which is the same as its valence, so it is a neutral atom. It is simply that the electron is unpaired. The next thing we must address is how radicals form. In most organic reactions, every step involves heterolytic bond cleavage, or heterolysis. This is where both of the electrons in a covalent bond stay together, like when a lone pair on a base gets a proton, and the electrons in this bond go to form some other bond, and so forth. Every bond that breaks and forms involves the activity of a pair of electrons, just like here, with A, B becoming A plus and B minus. But to get a radical, we will need homolytic bond cleavage, or homolysis. This is when a covalent bond breaks and each of the atoms participating in the bond will get one of the electrons, such as when AB becomes an A radical and a B radical. This activity is indicated by these single-headed arrows. Whereas regular electron-pushing arrows indicate the activity of a pair of electrons, these single-headed arrows indicate the activity of a singular electron. This seems subtle, but it is a very important distinction to make. What kinds of conditions will promote homolysis? Well, if we have a relatively weak covalent bond, like an oxygen-oxygen bond or a halogen-halogen bond, and we consider the electrons as sitting in a sigma bonding orbital with the empty antibonding orbital above, sufficient heating or collision with a photon of UV light will promote one of the bonding electrons up to the antibonding orbital. If this occurs, the bond order becomes zero and the bond will break. Let's first speak generally about radical reactions, or reactions that radicals can undergo. There are three types of steps that can occur in any radical reaction. First, they must always begin with an initiation reaction. The radicals must be generated from some covalent species, so any initiation step will begin with something covalent and end with two radicals. Because a bond is breaking, initiation steps are always endothermic, and thus have a positive delta H. Then, once the radicals have been generated, there will be some number of propagation steps. This is where one radical propagates the existence of some other radical. This will be either exothermic or endothermic, depending on the bond enthalpies associated with the bonds being broken and formed. Then, the existence of radicals can end via a termination step. This is where two radicals meet and form a covalent bond, so we are going from two radicals to one covalent species. Because we are forming a bond, energy must be released, so termination steps are always exothermic and will have a negative delta H. To get a little more specific, let's see how this applies to a particular radical reaction, free radical halogenation. This involves placing a halogen on a molecule, typically an alkene. Let's examine the chlorination of methane so that we can see every step of the mechanism one at a time. First, we must have an initiation step. 
This is where the chlorine-chlorine bond will undergo homolysis under exposure to ultraviolet radiation, which is present in sunlight. Now we have chlorine radicals, and propagation steps can begin. The chlorine radical is quite unstable, so it will seek to react, and if it collides with methane, it can interact with a carbon-hydrogen bond such that one electron from that bond will combine with the chlorine radical to form HCl, while the carbon atom will hold on to the other electron. This will leave us with a methyl radical. Then, if this methyl radical encounters another chlorine molecule, which will be much more abundant in solution than the chlorine radical, we can get another propagation step, whereby one of the electrons in this bond will combine with this lone electron to give a carbon-chlorine bond, and the other electron will remain with the other chlorine to give another chlorine radical. And there we have chloromethane. Of course, termination steps are also possible in solution. Two chlorine radicals could meet and bond, two methyl radicals could meet and bond to form ethane, or a chlorine radical and methyl radical could bond to form the product. However, these are not specifically required for the formation of our product. We should point out that this is unlikely to stop here. We have three more carbon-hydrogen bonds left, and if a chlorine radical collides with one of these, further reactions can take place. This can result in a second, third, or even a fourth chlorine atom getting on there. While most of the reactions we learn do not involve free radicals, it is very important to know what these are and how radical mechanisms work with initiation, propagation, and termination steps. Professor Dave for Chegg. See you next time.